impossible to lift ourselves over a fence by our bootstraps. It is possible, it can be easy, to lift ourselves over life's obstacles by the force of our applied imagination. And how many of us use it, huh? Very few. Mm, I tell you, even when bodies go out of whack, heightened creative effort may be as helpful as surgery or drugs. Betsy Barton is one source for this statement. Through her early years, she was light-hearted, light-footed, and full of fun. Then, in her early teens, riding home with her brother one evening, her car overturned, and she was maimed. After several operations by the world's best surgeons, she was told that her spinal cord had been severed and could not be re-spliced. It was almost as hard for her to walk as if she had no legs at all. But by exercise and courage, she at last made herself walk well enough to demonstrate to returning legless veterans how they too could walk again. Today she's a charming, cheerful doer of great and good deeds. Now, apart from exercise, it was creative activity above all else which enabled this fine woman to remake her life. She heroically fanned her creative spark until it flamed with a health-giving heat. And for one who had never thought she could write, she became a truly great writer, as her new novel has so eloquently proved. For one who had done no art except little girl scribbles, she learned to paint like a professional. Betsy Barton has pointed out that many a creative great has been diseased or handicapped. Keats is the most famous, she says, but Thomas Mann and Noel Coward have never been fully well. Catherine Mansfield, Emerson, Thoreau were all sickly. Hausman said he did his best work when he fell ill. So Alex Osborne asked her, but instead of being any richer in talent while unwell, could it be that those writers instinctively sought to forget their ills by losing themselves in supreme effort? Couldn't they actually make themselves feel better by acquiring the glow that comes from thinking of something worthwhile? And she said, yes. We all know the sense of well-being that flows from just having an idea and putting it into words or action. Even by writing an amusing letter, we can add a spark to our daily lives. She said, there is no question but that the more we try to create, the better we feel. And this holds true with both the well and the unwell. You know, it's a funny thing, but to most people, work and fun can never be synonymous. But the fact is that creative work can be fun. By and large, no people enjoy their toil as much as those who deal in ideas. Did you know that? They enjoy their work more than anybody else. Movie makers, authors, artists, advertising men, reporters, stylists, Creative researchers are prone to gripe that stomach ulcers are the wound stripes of their professions. But at heart they know that although necessity is often the mother of creative effort, fun is often the father. People can get more fun out of life by making more of their imaginations. But creative effort offers still another compensation. A person can make himself grow by making his creative spark glow. Building one's own stature by heightening one's creative energy is, as Phelan said, like lifting yourself up by your bootstraps. But as Joseph Jastrow has written, strange as this seems, there is plenty of proof that it is really so. Yes, the more creative you are, the more of a person you become. The more you rub your creative lamp, the more alive you feel and the more alive will be everyone with whom you come in contact. Your children, your husband, your wife, your friends and relatives. Of course, the cash rewards of creative effort are plenty. And there's plenty to go around. But the more frequent and more fruitful rewards come in the coin of happier living. And who could ask for anything more than that, huh? especially in our earlier years, all of us possess a creative urge. 
Now when this yin has too little outlet, frustration sets in and such frustration undermines happiness. Our talents are constantly craving outlet. More than that, they're constantly craving development. When we damn them up, they torment us. Thus the cause of our discontent can often be traced to failure to exercise our creative aptitudes. Did you know that all of us are born with creative talent? It's true. Altogether too much emphasis has been placed on this routine, this old hogwash about people being born to be a certain way, being born to be poor, or being born to be this, or being born to be that. That's nothing but a bunch of swill. A person can become just about what he wants to become. All of us are blessed with some degree of imagination, even when it comes to art. Creativity is no rarity. An imaginative power bears but little relationship to schooling as illustrated by the story about the Texas cattleman. This Texas cattle raiser saw an Illinois car approaching his home. So he dashed into the kitchen to his cook and he said, he said, a big packer from up north is coming in. When I was in Chicago, I boasted to him that we have a bull here on the ranch that races the Sunset Limited 25 miles across our ranch every morning and always wins. <laughs> the man wanted to see the critter, and now he's here. You've got to handle him. I've gone away. Well, he just sneaked out. So the cook went to the front and greeted the visitor with the explanation that his boss had just left for New Orleans, then to Jacksonville and Atlanta, then to New York, then to Toronto, then to Cleveland and Cincinnati on the way to Chicago, then St. Louis, then to Denver, then to Seattle, then home after a visit in Hollywood. So the Illinois visitor said, wow, what a trip. He says, how long before you'll be back? So the cook says, two days. He said, two days? How's he traveling, in a jet plane? And the cook said, no, sir. He's riding bareback. He's riding on that fast running bull of his. <laughs> well, that's creative imagination. To be a problem solver, we do not have to have the talent of a genius such as Leonardo da Vinci. Called the most versatile human being who ever lived, he gave birth to thousands of brain children. Many of his ideas were 500 years ahead of his time. Did you know, for example, that 500 years ago, over 500 years ago, Leonardo da Vinci invented in his mind a self-driven automobile, various gear combinations, roller bearings, air conditioning, excavating machines, hydraulic tools, airplanes, helicopters, submarines. He also created masterpieces of sculpture, painting, music, and architecture. But we shouldn't let a record like that stop us from trying to be more creative in lesser ways. The least we should say to ourselves is that if da Vinci could do that much, surely we can put our creative talent to a greater use than we do. In the words of Lord Macaulay, the imaginations of most of us are like the wings of an ostrich. They enable us to run, though not to soar. But many of us don't even walk. We either stand still creatively, or worse than that, we slide back from an imaginative childhood into a non-creative adulthood. Gustave Flaubert said, talent is our affair. We can shrivel it through disuse, or we can build it up by practicing creativity, by solving problems, by using our leisure in ways that will exercise our imagination until we become happy, vital, intelligent people. Creative and productive people are not creative and productive for the benefit of others. It's because they're driven by the need to be creative and productive. They'd be creative and productive if they each lived on a deserted island and simply had to stack what he produced in a big pile with no one benefiting or even aware of what he was doing. You'll hear people say that we're happiest when we're serving others, and that's true, but it's not true because of any great altruism on our part. It's true because we experience the joy of producing something. That others benefit from it is fine, but only secondary. It's good to know that others benefit from and enjoy what we produce. There's satisfaction in that, ego satisfaction, and the desire to produce more. If everyone continually rejected our creative or productive efforts, we might become sullen and resentful. We might even stop all efforts for a while. But eventually, we'd begin to produce again in the hope that eventually someone would see the sense of what we're doing. 
This is the story of the painters who were before their time. Renoir, who was laughed at and rejected not only by the public, but by his own fellow artists. We look at a painting by Renoir today and marvel that anything so fine and beautiful could have ever been an object of scorn. And he painted thousands of paintings. He went right on producing them. When he brought one of his canvases to one of the most eminent Parisian teachers, the expert glanced at the work and said, You are, I presume, dabbling in paint to amuse yourself. And Renoir replied, Of course. When it ceases to amuse me, I'll stop painting. Everything he painted delighted him, and he painted everything. Even Manet said to Monet, Renoir has no talent at all. You who are his friend should tell him kindly to give up painting. A group of artists who were rejected by the establishment of their time formed their own association in self-defense. Do you know who were in that group? They were Degas, Pizarro, Monet, Cezanne, and Renoir, five of the greatest artists of all time, all doing what they believed in in the face of total rejection. Since we're on the subject of Renoir, in his later life he suffered terribly, you know, from rheumatism, especially in his hands. He lived in constant pain. And when Matisse visited the aging painter, he saw that every stroke was causing renewed pain, and he asked, Why do you still have to work? Why continue to torture yourself? And Renoir answered, The pain passes, but the pleasure, the creation of beauty remains. One day, when he was 78, and quite famous and successful, finally, he said, I'm still making progress. And the next day, he was dead. This is the mark of a creative, productive person, still making progress, still learning, still producing as long as he lives, despite pain or problems of all kinds. Not producing for the joy or satisfaction of others, but because he must, because it gives him pleasure and satisfaction. Creative people are invariably intelligent people, and they're curious about themselves, those around them, and the world in which they live. This is the kind of curiosity that's been called one of the permanent and certain characteristics of a vigorous intellect. Questions are the creative acts of the intelligence, and the questions that work hardest for us and bring us the greatest amount of useful information are the open-ended questions. Now, these are questions that can't be answered with a simple yes or no. They're asked by using the six W's, H and I technique. Who, what, when, where, why, which, how, and if. Rudyard Kipling put it this way. I had six honest serving men. They taught me all I knew. Their names were where and what and when, and why and how and who. All we're doing is adding two more, which and if. Now this isn't entirely new to us. We employed the six W's, H, and I all the time when we were children. Have you ever tried to count the number of times each day a four or five-year-old uses the word why? You see, each question a child asks is an attempt to add to his limited knowledge. When adults lose patience with this constant barrage of questions, the child either finds some other way of getting the information or just forgets the whole thing, thereby neglecting a valuable tool he'll want later in life, the open-ended question. Now, as adults, we know that Inside the mind of each person we meet, there is some knowledge that could benefit us if only we could learn what it is. The open-ended question technique really opens people up. By asking open-ended questions, we get people to remove the barriers that normally keep this information out of our grasp. Human beings like to talk about things that interest them. Open-ended questions let people know we want to hear their ideas, opinions, and thoughts. Each of us has two ears and one mouth, and it seems to be a good idea to do at least twice as much listening as talking. An old Texas friend of mine used to say, you ain't learning nothing while you're talking. But the object of asking open-ended questions isn't merely to get other people to talk. We could spend days standing around gabbing with people who have very little to say that would benefit us. Instead, the object of our who, what, when, where, why, which, how, and if questions is to gather, absorb, and utilize that information which will be useful to us, move us ahead in the fields of our own interests and endeavors. But in so doing, we're also employing the best technique known for making friends, for success in human relations, and for selling our own ideas. Oddly enough, the more we listen, the better conversationalist we seem to the person doing the talking. One of this country's top newsmen set a good example of this kind of purposeful questioning he knew how to ask open-ended questions so provocatively that he could almost always get world leaders to give him exclusive interviews. His wise questions earned him the highest position in his field, that of chief executive for one of the great news services. 
And the open-ended question is equally useful to the businessman. Suppose, for instance, that you've just met a Mr. Smith who's an official of a company operating in an area different from your own. Instead of talking about the weather, you might ask him, Mr. Smith, how did you get into your line of work? Now, here's a man who obviously has some degree of success in business, so you stand an excellent chance of learning something that will be useful to you. One of the best salesmen I know uses open-ended questions to great advantage when he's talking with a prospect. Instead of saying, we make the best thingamabob in the world, he asks, Mr. Prospect, when you buy thingamabobs, what features are most important to you? Here's an effective method for taking people off the offensive, for getting them to talk to your advantage. This technique works well for anyone who will give some thought to what he's going to say, rather than just blurting out the first thing that pops into his mind. So ask, skillfully, probing open-ended questions, and ask them in a sincere, courteous manner. Anyone who uses the six W's H and I technique wisely, courteously, and with those people who can contribute something to his understanding, will quickly find this to be one of his most useful creative techniques. The best way I know to practice asking open-ended questions is to try out a few on myself. If this sounds like a good idea, you might want to try it too. Ask yourself, who has a greater knowledge of my job than I? What can I do to learn some of the things he knows, but I don't? Why must my job be done this way? And if there is a better way to do my job, what would it be? The housewife and the student can make up a similar set of questions that will be just as stimulating in their own fields. Take time to ponder these questions. Their answers, the facts and information you'll gain, can make your life infinitely more interesting and rewarding. And whenever you talk with others, use lots of open-ended questions. They're your most valuable creative tools. Now we're ready to examine the best techniques for using our creative faculties more effectively to solve problems, make decisions, achieve goals, and better fulfill our ultimate responsibility as human beings, to think. Have you ever considered that you can think in various ways? Let's look at some ways to think. First, think association. An example of thinking association is that the best way to remember names is to associate them with familiar objects or words. Two more examples of thinking association are the key word and the association list techniques. The key word technique is used by people who want to remember a series of ideas. They join the initial letters of the idea words together to form a simple key word. By remembering the key word, they can recall the whole series of ideas. An association list is used by memory experts to recall prodigious lists of articles by associating each one with another article in a previously memorized list. The creative person is forever associating ideas and continually searching for associative relationships. Next, think combination. Almost everything in nature is a combination of elements. You're quite a combination yourself. Scientists calculate that if the energy in the hydrogen atoms of your body could be utilized, you could supply all the electrical needs of the entire country for nearly a week. A DuPont scientist says that the atoms of your body contain a potential energy of more than 11 million kilowatt hours per pound. A simple pencil is a combination of wood, carbon, rubber, paint, metal. A few more examples might include ham and eggs, pi a la mode, radio, TV, and record player combinations, and orbiting satellites combined with microwave telephone relay stations. Somebody dreamed up the idea of combining comedy and music, and musical comedy was born. You can come up with some really great ideas by finding new combinations yourself. Everything you see, hear, touch, taste, and smell during the day offers opportunity to consider new combinations. When you brush your teeth, you might think of a toothbrush that contains the toothpaste in the handle. You might combine your mirror with a motto reminding you to start the day right. It might read, how can I increase my service today? Or, today is the only time I've got. I'll use it well. So let's think combination. Next. Think adaptation. Burlap fabric originally used for making gunny sacks has been adapted for drapes, wall covering, and stylish dresses. Some salesmen were thinking adaptation. Airplane seat belts have been adapted for use in automobiles to bring new safety to highway driving. The phonograph record and motion picture, originally developed for entertainment, are today adapted for instruction and education. Rocket motors, which were developed to propel atomic missiles, have been adapted to lift peaceful space vehicles into orbital and interplanetary flight. During the next year, you're going to see the result of people thinking adaptation and coming up with ideas worth thousands of dollars. Why couldn't one of these people be you? 
the only limit to what you can achieve by adapting old products to new uses, old methods to new applications, is the limit of your own creativity. Next, think substitution. When you think substitution, you ask yourself how you might substitute a different material or thing for the one now used. For example, plastic is used as a substitute for wood and metal. Aluminum is a substitute for other metals. Stainless steel is often substituted for chrome. The transistor often replaces the vacuum tube. Old weathered planking can be used as a substitute for a conventional wall in a family room or study with dramatic and interesting effect. In short, don't assume that because a particular thing has always been used in the past that you have to use it now. Perhaps there's a substitute that will work better or last longer or cost less or be lighter or more colorful and so forth. Let's think substitution. Next, think magnification. Think big. Example, skyscrapers, the Pentagon, king-size soft drinks, giant economy-sized packages. What do you work with that might be made larger? Or, think minification, think small. Examples, the solar battery, the transistor, the compact car, tiny radios that fit into your pocket, small portable TV sets, smaller sized food products. How about the bikini? That's certainly thinking small. And now to keep your mind moving, think rearrangement. That is, turn things around, backward, upside down, or inside out. An interesting example of this was when someone came up with the idea of putting the mink on the inside of a woman's coat. All the warmth, luxury, and status of full-length mink in a casual coat. And it's nothing more than a mink coat turned inside out. Another good example of this is the building with its skeletal framework outside. The building is suspended inside. Insects have their skeletons outside. We have ours inside. They both work fine. What do you work with that can benefit from this kind of thinking? What can you turn around, revolutionize? Rearrange things, change pace, alter sequence, think of modifying, changing color, motion, timing, sound, odor, taste, form, and shape. This type of thinking works for everyone. Salesmen use these creative techniques to discover new applications for products or services, new ways of emphasizing customer benefits, new ideas to solve customer problems, better ways to organize their time and effort. Summing up, if you want to spur your mind to new action, think combination, association, adaptation, substitution, magnification, minification, and rearrangement. If at first you force, literally force your mind to think in all these seven ways, you'll probably be amazed with the ideas you develop. And before long, you'll find yourself thinking in each of these ways as a matter of course. This kind of thinking increases the scope of your mind power and enables you to achieve fuller use of your brain. Your mind has an infinite variety of things it can do and an infinite capacity for work. Let it work for you. Take nothing for granted. Everything can and will be changed, improved. The only thing you can count on for certain is change. Don't wait for it. Be in the forefront. Help bring it about. Here's a little story to test how good a thinker you are. Many years ago, when a person who owed money could be thrown into jail, a merchant in London had the misfortune to owe a huge sum to a mean moneylender. The moneylender, who was old and ugly, fancied the merchant's beautiful young daughter, and he proposed a bargain. He said he'd cancel the merchant's debt if he could have the girl instead. Well, both the merchant and his daughter were horrified at the suggestion, so the cunning moneylender proposed that they let Providence decide the matter. He told him that he'd put a black pebble and a white pebble into an empty money bag, and then the girl would have to pick out one of the pebbles. If she chose the black pebble, she would become his wife, and her father's debt would be canceled. If she chose the white pebble, she would stay with her father, and the debt would still be canceled. But if she refused to pick a pebble, her father would be thrown into jail, and she would starve. Well, reluctantly, the merchant agreed. They were standing on a pebble-strewn path in the merchant's garden at the time as they talked, and the moneylender stooped down to pick up the two pebbles. As he did, the girl, sharp-eyed with fright, noticed that he picked up two black pebbles and put them into the money bag. He wasn't taking any chances. He then asked the girl to pick out the pebble that was to decide her fate and that of her father. 
Now imagine you're standing on that path in the merchant's garden. What would you have done if you'd been the girl? If you had to advise her, what would you have advised her to do? Now what type of thinking would you use to solve the problem? You may think that careful logical analysis must solve the problem if there's a solution. This type of thinking is straightforward vertical thinking. The other type of thinking is lateral thinking. Vertical thinkers are usually not of much help to a girl in this situation. The way they analyze it, there are three possibilities. One, the girl should refuse to take a pebble. Two, the girl should show that there are two black pebbles in the bag and expose the money lender as a cheat. Three, the girl should take a black pebble and sacrifice herself in order to save her father from prison. Well, none of these suggestions is very helpful, for if the girl does take a pebble, then she has to marry the money lender. If not, her father goes to prison. Well, the girl in the story put her hand into the money bag and drew out a pebble. Without looking at it, she fumbled and let it fall to the path where it was immediately lost among all the others. Oh, how clumsy of me, she said. But never mind. Just look in the bag. You'll be able to tell which pebble I took by the color of the one that's remaining. Since the remaining pebble is, of course, black, it must be assumed that she's taken the white pebble, since the moneylender dare not admit his dishonesty. That's what's called lateral thinking. It not only solves problems, but it also improves on the situation. It's a well-established yet always surprising bit of knowledge that the answer to even our most pressing problem, provided, of course, that it lies within the realm of human solution, is usually at hand. It requires, however, a different kind of insight to see it. Children seem to be better at lateral thinking than grown-ups, unless grown-ups work at it and practice it. We all were highly creative children at one time, before we had it worn off or knocked out of us by unimaginative dull adults. The management of a large electronics firm had struggled for months with a production problem that resisted all its efforts to solve. There were nine women working on that particular assembly line, and finally, in desperation, the management people asked their help in solving the problem. They solved it in a week, and in so doing, greatly reduced the cost of producing the product. They'd been producing it the old way because that's what they had been told to do. They hadn't been asked to do it the best way they could think of. Go to work on your problems in the same way, if you're in a problem-solving kind of work. If you're not in a problem-solving kind of work, you're unemployed. I understand that it's particularly difficult for professional people to think creatively and laterally. It's because they've been so thoroughly conditioned by their education. They've always been told what to do, and they've been told how it's always been done, and they were never asked how to do it better.